know, in the old days, uh, when you talk about um, IT infrastructure, so compute, storage, databases, things like that, companies had to uh, buy them themselves. Yeah, you had to pay a lot of money up front to actually get access to just all compute infrastructure to be able to run your business. Um, when we introduced cloud computing, that's well over 10 years ago, as Amazon has been the pioneer in that world, um, you no longer need to buy these things up front. They are provided to as software, so compute, storage, databases, but also a whole range of other functionality. So you can do service, so you can do build mobile applications, so you can build IoT applications, all these things without having to own any hardware, but actually only paying for that what you use. And so that's one of the major differences as well in the past. It's not just that cloud computing is some sort of technical revolution, not from mainframe to mini and client server and web and now cloud. If that would be the case, it wouldn't be this big. There's a, there's a radical different economic model. That's yeah. that where in the past you had to pay up front for everything. You pay up front for your servers, you pay up front for your databases, all these kind of things. These days, with cloud computing, the model is that you only have to pay for what you use. And so that means that it shifts from what's called capital expense, so capex to opex. You only pay for what you've used. And as such, you can drive the cost down tremendously. And especially when we're talking about startups, this was hugely important. Because when, when in the old days, you know, you had to get $5 million of investment to be able to build any form of sort of internet scale startup. You know, companies like Pinterest or Airbnb or, or Uber or Spotify would never have got them off the ground. If at this scale that they are now within a few years. So you're saying if I'm starting a company called, I don't know, Pipe Piper. <laughs> there I, probably is a company more right yeah, I'm almost certain there is. Um, I don't have to load up my garage full of servers and things like that to get, get my product off the ground. No, I mean, it, 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 it also changes the atmosphere for startups tremendously. You know, you, you know when you start to have a startup, you start off with a brilliant idea. This is one of our builds. You, know, you never think about that you have to get servers and IT folks and network and contract negotiations and then you think about, oh, you know, I also want to launch it in Europe and then you have to do all of that stuff again in, in Frankfurt. And then you have to do it in Sydney and then you have to do it in Japan. These days, if clients just click off a button, you can launch anything that you build here, anywhere else in the world. And so, the, yeah, we, 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 we joke that in the past, you know, you would need $5 million as a startup to get off the ground. Now it's $50,000 and a box of ramen. And you can, you can, you can, you can tweet that, by the way. You need $50,000 in a box of ramen to get yes. a startup off the ground. You learned that in Williamsburg. Yeah, so, so if you talk about any of the venture capitalists, for example, yeah. they, the, the tremendous rise of uh, startup business that we see today is mostly driven by the fact that starting a company is so much cheaper today and each company can immediately start focusing on what differentiates them instead of doing everything the same. Right. So, so often people ask me why did Amazon get into this whole cloud computing that business? That was actually going to be my next question. Hey, look at that. How did a book retailer end up building a yes. platform for startups everywhere? The, the, let's go back to the early 2000s. So in those days, it became more popular to open up sort of parts of your business with an API. So it's like all the people could be able to get it. You could drive innovation. And so we'd opened up a catalog of the Amazon the retailer so that other companies could build against it. And we saw great new companies being built. But the moment that each of those companies became successful, they all started to stub turn. Yeah, and why? Because they all had to get in, they also had to go bigger. They had to get investment, they had to buy servers, they had to get hardware, they had to hire IT people. And most of those companies failed because of that. They either couldn't get the investment or they didn't have the expertise to run at scale. And then we saw that. And we figured out, oh, no, well, wait, we figured that stuff out for ourselves. Why don't we start taking some of the ideas that we used internally to how Amazon moves fast and scales fast and things like that, and make those available to the outside world as well. And so that was 10 years ago, um, and we launched the first storage service and computer service in those days. And um, here's where the other. So Amazon really built this, this infrastructure for itself first. Going back even further, build it for itself, right? Well, it's not, yeah. not the identical infrastructure. See, all the principles behind it, we laid out for ourselves maturely because Amazon, we pride ourselves of being a really fast moving innovative company. Yes, you, especially if you're a digital only company, yeah, competition is around the corner. Yeah, there's, 
And it's not like that there is another big e-commerce retailer that will take over your business. It will be there's someone that does diapers better, there's someone that does shoes better. Now, that 5,000 cuts, and especially as a digital company, that's much more likely to happen. And so many startups can actually start taking on you. And it's not only in retail, we see that in financial services, we see that everywhere. Um, so for Amazon itself, it was already continues to be important to move fast, to innovate really fast, and so we build an infrastructure for, 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 for that. So we could take the same sort of principles that made our own industry is very successful, and now move to the outside world as well. And so the first thing is that, of course, while we started building this for some of these young businesses to be really successful, enterprises within no time had figured out that this was way too good a deal for them as well. Right, so you talked about competition. Mm -hmm. All right, fast forward to today. <coughs> Amazon has something over, depending on who's measuring and to what extent you measure, you know, about a third of the market share in cloud. Um, the next two, this is cloud services, so the next two are uh, uh, Microsoft and IBM, and then beyond that is Google and even the next three is like something like 22%. You guys are way ahead of everybody else because of this very prescient decision. Now, everybody loves the cloud, right? Everybody wants in on it. Everybody wants to build their businesses on top of it. How has that changed the way you're operating Amazon today? Actually, it changed not at all. <laughs> no, for us, actually, no. We actually kind of surprised that it took us so long to actually start actually engaging in this business. This is a way to good a business to be in because you know, this is how the world has been changing. Uh, all this, I uh, always, because I've, I've been on the receiving end of these old IT companies as well as the CTO of Amazon, and I hated that interaction. I hated the fact that it was always the vendor that was in charge. I, as a customer, was never in charge. The only way to actually get price down was to make very long term commitments and pay massive amounts of money up front. And now that I talk to many of, of the customers that we have, I hear that it's the same everywhere. For any other company, often you buy. 30 to 40 percent more licenses than you really need just because you want to get this deal done. And so everybody hates their IT vendors. And we really, as Amazon, the retailer, as you might know, has as, as a motto to be the first most customer centric company. And so when we built this business, we thought, no, oh, wait, you know, we're going to take exactly the same principles and transplant it into this, into this IT world as well, where we need to be on our toes every day to deliver the absolute best service, otherwise our customers can walk away. Yeah, because they're no longer contractually obliged to actually stick with us. So, if you think about competition, we need to be the absolute best to keep customers with us. And what does that mean, best, right? Well, so, in, is in it, my is eyes, it cost? Is it service? No, no so I don't think that's so. First of all, I think cloud is defined by, so by its benefits. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, no more capital, that means you don't have to pay the fund. You switch money to OPEX, you can reduce operational expense by only using, only having to pay for what you really have used. Uh, no more capacity planning. Uh, capacity planning for us at Amazon was a nightmare. Really, you, if you would buy too much hardware, your CFO would be unhappy. If you didn't buy enough hardware, your customers would be unhappy because you couldn't serve them right, right away. Um, all that undifferentiating had to be hardware, data centers, networks, all of the stuff you know we need to think about. You need to be able to move faster. And you need to be able to deploy the streets worldwide. Yeah? And so those are the benefits. And those come with cloud. Yes, that's where customers have to look for it to think. And then why are we in a unique position there? Because we've, it took us a while to really make sure that cloud really blew, uh, came up in full, full bloom. And what I mean by that is that operating services for more than a million, we almost more than a million businesses worldwide, is not a simple thing to do. Uh, there, there's this great saying, I think Jeff has done this, there is no compression algorithm for experience. Yeah? There's no but, well. <laughs> No, so you have to go through this, you have to learn how to serve your customers in this, this, this world, in this new IT world. And I think at Amazon, having such a strong customer-centric history, are uniquely positioned to be successful in this world. If you look at our, our future roadmap, yeah, so last year we launched well over 700 new main features and services, yeah, all driven by our customers. We have this very close relationship with, with, with our customers where we actually allow our customers to drive our roadmap instead of that we build these, that we, we are holier than thou and decide what we should do for our customers. And that, that creates a relationship between you and your customers that is unique. And I think that most of the other players 
they're very much competition focused. Right. Now, you know, the competitor following strategy as a business strategy is a good strategy. Yeah, I, I it's understand just not, that. It's just not us. It's just not us. Yeah. What? T tell me a little. So we've been kind of. Had, no pun intended, but I'll make it anyway. We've, had, we've kind of had our heads in the cloud through this whole conversation. We haven't gotten down to the specifics. Tell me a little bit about some of your customers. What are they doing? What kind of businesses are being built on, on, on AWS today? You know, what, what's really exciting to you well, most actually, recently? Well, most recently, um, in the well, customers. let's, let's, let's do two, two pieces. Let's just first look at sort of what are the different things that are happening in and around the cloud. I think there's probably no household name today that doesn't run in the cloud. So all the things, um, of course, nobody here uses Tinder. Yeah? <laughs> None of them. But you all know about Tinder. Yeah, of course. You know, Tinder couldn't be built, but you know, but on, on the on the cloud. You know, there isn't a, any company today that has a, any idea about how fast they're going to be successful. Will not be able to become successful if they have to worry about all these IT resources that they need. Um, Is Tinder a customer? Of course. Yeah. Otherwise, I wouldn't mention it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it goes all the way from uh, you know about the Mars rover. When you know about Mars, Mars Rover well, sends its data back into the Amazon cloud where it's being analyzed and made available for resources around the world. You know, there are sensors at the bottom of the ocean that, that flow data back into the cloud. You know, whether it's Time magazine yeah, here in New York, for example, that actually is moving, it's going all in, moving all of its uh, uh, digital properties over to AWS. Uh, with young businesses here, there's a revolutionary one, Oscar Health, for example, here. Everybody knows uh, Oscar, right? They saw the subway. Yeah. Yeah, but it's actually it's not an, it's a young business, uh, you know, running all in onto AWS, um, Foursquare, SoundCloud, you know, all, all of these companies, all of the household names that have today is being sort of the popular new kids on the block, all of them on AWS. Now these are these are very very different businesses, right? You've got the Mars rover, talk about an outlier. Tinder, healthcare, uh, uh, publishing, Pharm pharmaceuticals, uh, take Bristol Myers Squibb. They, exactly. they, they have been able to reduce the clinical trials by 98%. And so that means that people spend much less time in clinical trials, for, for example. There's a company called Cycle Compute that does uh, drug research on top of our, our cloud. And they are able to do sort of this cancer to uh, drug research simulations that is basically. Uh, you need to use two hands for that. Yeah, so you have a protein and you have a, a key that you try to walk into that to see whether you can inhibit certain properties of, of the protein. And that is basically doing having a whole million keys and trying it in the lock. Those kind of computational algorithms take months to run on premise. In the cloud, two hours for fifteen thousand dollars. Because you have so much you have so much power on yeah. demand. Right. Yeah, so you you get it whenever you want. You don't have to pre-buy into it or anything like that. And then go all the way to the other hand. You know, we talked about competition before. I think for every enterprise is being focusing on sort of what's called digital transformation. Today. Yes. Becoming a digital company. There's a great quote by the CEO of General Electric that says, you know, one night you go to bed as a manufacturing company, the next day you wake up as a software and analytics company. And that's for example the whole transition that GE is going through. Not surprisingly, they're moving 9,000 workloads over to AWS right. and closing 30 of the 34 data centers because they don't need to want to think about that piece anymore. They want to think about what are the things they can compete on and do better with their customers. So, how does all of this impact what you do, right? So, you, you were saying before, oh, the competition hasn't really changed what we do, but you've got all these different businesses and they all have their own particular needs, right? Yeah. You know, doing drug research is very different than publishing, it's very different than whatever. And yeah, you can throw it all up against. You know, into the cloud, but over the years, have their particular needs changed the way you built this thing? Absolutely. You have to think about that well, the story I told you about how we got started in all of that. We were thinking about sort of internet scale companies, yeah, the, the, the future Amazons of this world. Um, and we weren't really that much thinking about the, expi the explicit needs of, for example, large enterprises when it comes to regulated industries. Right. Yeah, whether it's financial services or healthcare or, or pharmaceuticals, all of the particular regulations that they need to uh, uh, apply. And so over time, we've been building a lot of new tools um, that are really triggered by having these, these industries as our customers. The cool thing is that we don't build them for them specifically, because once we build them for them, everybody gets them. Right. For example, here in New York, FINRA, which is part of the SEC, Basically, is the, the, the SEC institution that takes all the data that in real time from 
from the uh, different uh, marketplaces, so NASDAQ and, and, and a lot of us, in real time, analyzes them, things like that, and it's highly sensitive data. Figma came with a whole set of very specific requirements around uh, auditing and trailing and things like, like that. But when we build them, we, everybody gets them, right? Now, even the smallest, even the smallest startup gets exactly the same security technology as everybody else. So when you brought up a fintech company, just a general entity, uh, large companies were terrified of this. What do you mean? What do you mean I'm going to put my HR data on somebody else's servers? What do you mean? You know, the idea of not having it in the in the basement yeah. was terrifying, right? Is that over? Is there still a little bit of concern there? I mean, it's been a decade, you've said. No, if, if there is concern, it's more emotional than that it's based on facts. Let me put it like that. And, and so, first of all, every com every company should do due diligence about how they're using any any services. Yeah, right, right, really so. But I think, fortunately, we've reached the point where security in the cloud is such it's superior to what you ever will be able to build on more premise. Yeah, and most companies have to realize that. Uh, Capital One, uh, on stage, I think in our user conference, I think a half a year ago, said that security was the reason why they were moving over to AWS. And quite a few of the banks, for example, aren't taking that, that reasoning. Um, so everything is interconnected, right? Here in New York, we love a doomsday scenario. Thanks for a good movie. Yeah. Um, we always worry, oh God, what happens if New York blows up? You know, the economy will ground will halt, everything will stop. We like to think that way. Yeah. Um, what happens if Amazon has a problem? I mean, you've got our dating apps on there, <laughs> our healthcare, our Mars rovers. Should we be concerned that a, you know an Amazon data center goes down and, and half the world services oh, or, goes down? Or, too? Or Etsy and Yellow. Oh, you right. can't find you can't find the best thing. You like Etsy uh, here? Sure. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Or you can't buy any this other new thing anymore. No. Um, so first and foremost, we have twelve regions around the world. So regions are clusters of data centers. And within those regions, we've built things in such a way that you can build what's called highly available systems. So you can build them in a situation with lots of best practices where we help also young businesses with the right architectural principles that even if disaster happens you can still continue to function. Yeah, and I think these days, you know, there should never be a case anymore where a website goes down, whatever disaster that there, there, there is. Ever. And ever, I think, yeah. Um, yeah. Said, we give you sure. all the tools, if you follow the architectural principles, we give you all the tools and mechanisms to make sure that your business can be available for everyone. You know what, 10 years ago, you need to hire computer scientists to, to do this. Right. These days, everybody with a good, decent set of engineers can actually build highly available applications that you know make sure you can continue to run your business. And that's the kind of the great benefit that I always hear when I talk to executives. They say, you know, we don't need all these specialized technologists anymore. You know, the folks at Amazon and your rivals, you know, they build these systems and then we can kind of spin up computers without the knowledge, right? Well, that's well you still idea. have to follow the best practices. You know, you still have to do it. Right. So, yeah, I mean, but we help you with that. We have solution architects, we do all these things, handheld, especially for uh, we, coming back to startups. Now, it's really important for us to help startups be as efficient as possible. You know, we, this is for us what we call a high volume, low margin business. That means that we're much more interested in making sure that you're our customers for the long term. Yeah? And we don't try to squeeze every penny out of every startup here. We're really working with each and every startup to make sure that they're architected in such a way that they can keep total controls, total control over their cost. Yeah? We call this sort of cost-aware architectures that only, only when you become really successful, you know, your cost are growing as well. Which is something that in the old days we had to pre-buy pre all these things, you would never be able to be cost-effective. Right? So one thing that I've been wondering is, you know, AWS has become such a large part of Amazon's portfolio. It's a great success story. You can see it when the company announces its earnings. I mean, it's, it's incredible. And when the company decided to actually release the numbers for the first time not so long ago, everybody was blown away, right? I think you're stuck. Um, we, have, we have outlined what is essentially infrastructure, right? This is infrastructure to, a, 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 to well, to the name of this conference, innovation, right? Um, great. Uh, if you talk to the MTA, it's tough to be in the business of subways and things like that. And that's a whole lot of money, right? Oh, yes. Okay. okay. So this is, is great, 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 great open source software. It's called One Bus Away. It's actually built by University of Washington in Seattle. 
um, especially open source software developed by the university, that any MTA, any public transport system can actually install on their buses and where you can stand with your app and actually see how long it will take for the next bus to arrive at this point. Which so. every New Yorker <laughs> cheers, no doubt, right? So uh, what I was getting at was, is, is the cloud going to become a commodity? Right now you guys are riding great success the cloud is growing like gangbusters, whether it's you or Microsoft or Google or IBM or whatever. Um, is it, is, this is infrastructure. When will it become a commodity? When will the price kind of zero out and it'll be a tough business to be in? Well, first of all, I think there's a uh, Lydia Young, uh, one of the, the premier uh, analysts at Gartner, says that you can't treat these infrastructure companies as, uh, as commodities because there's so much differentiation between them. Yeah? Um, if you look at the several services that we have, it's well over 70 now. It's no longer computer storage and databases. It is really looking at how can we help people build mobile applications much better. Because remember, mobile, it, it, we all use our phones with these mobile apps, but you don't realize that probably 95% of that app runs in the cloud. Right. Yeah? Mobile devices are just a window to functionality and data that lives in the cloud. Now, if these days, I think, well, not maybe not in the US that much, but with the European football championships are starting sure, sure. tomorrow. Yeah, uh, all, all these apps, you know, they need to work for, what is it, for six weeks. That's all they need to work for. And, or, you know, this very uh, innovative old school called, if you like soccer, one football is a great app that gives you all the background tracking, things like that. Um, you know, whenever there's full matches, massive spiking capacity needed, these things can only be built when there's clouds. How, how did we get here? Uh, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was asking about the commodity, but I'm with you. No, 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 commodity. So, um, no, being, building mobile apps, building uh, Internet of Things. I mean, definitely something that is extremely heating up, not only on the consumer side, uh, where we have lots of customers uh, uh, that build in consumer type applications. You can talk about that next time if you want to. Um, or on the industrial side of things, yeah. So the industrial Internet of Things is, is absolutely exploding. Where every enterprise today, the move that's called Industry 4.0, is instrumenting everything on the on the uh, as a factory floor, all your supply chains, all your trucking, everything is being instrumented to create new data streams, which you can analyze to either improve efficiencies, to improve safety, all these things that they've been looking for and never have been able to get insight into their company. So. Internet of Things, um, enterprise services, run for your desktop, bring your own device to work. So cloud is a lot more, much, so much more than just these lower level building blocks, where actually most of our competitors still are. Um, but you know, where there's so much more than, than that. So you're taking a little more. To, that will continue to work. So commodity, it will be a long time before it's going to be yeah, you're taking a more holistic view of the cloud. Uh, when I talk to executives in this area, you know, they say, yeah, the, the, the basic compute and, and, and well, so precision. Most of yeah, it's mostly because you're still outside. thinking about what they were doing in their own data centers. Yeah? And so in their own data centers, they didn't, first of all, they didn't have the flexibility. Right. They didn't have these higher level services either. Yeah? And so they would have to buy software for that, things like that. So they, they often are still comparing sort of there's traditional environment with how the cloud looks like. Yep. But if you do that, then you pretty quickly start to realize that there's so much more in the cloud to do. Yeah, and that service in the cloud are not service in on premise. Right. They are hardware, they're constrained. Cloud has none of these constraints. So let's talk about one particular yeah. pillar app. Yeah. Let's talk about artificial intelligence, machine learning. Now, you, you, you offered two different flavors of this, right? You you said that there was this industrial aspect to it, and that's huge, and we should talk about that. That's IoT, yeah, that's not machine learning. Well, it can be machine learning. Can be. Yeah. Um, and then on top of that, you've got a very consumer. How many people actually have a, a, an Echo here? An Amazon Echo? Yeah? <laughs> it's my family up there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everybody knows these digital assistants, right? Whether it's Siri or, or, or Alexa or Cortana, the idea that these things are, are, are learning to get better, and they're doing that how? By connecting the servers. How does that impact what you do? How are you thinking about things in terms of Alexa? Well, first of all, Alexa and Echo are actually two different fields. Alexa is a device. Right. Alexa is limited. It's a cool device, but it's actually limited functionality. That is the number of microphones in it, it's being for me, speech synthesis, and can play music. That's all it can do. All the functionality lives in what's called the Alexa voice service, which lives in the cloud. And so it's not just Amazon that actually can make use of the uh, Alexa voice service. Everybody else can as well. You can build devices that integrate this for just putting this in your car, so you can drive home and say, hey Alexa, 
um, turned on the kitchen lights, opened the garage door, and set the temperature in my home to 20. If that will be something I should not go and start playing my touchy peppers with my program. Sure. From it, I Why not? Um, and so it is a platform, first of all, so that it, it's a service that lives in the cloud that can be connected to any device. Uh, part of that, and I think is because we think that voice is clearly sort of the next generation interface for computer pilots. Yeah? But it needs to be really good because we have very high expectations of organization. Yeah? Our conversations go, there is, there is no two second lag between, definitely not with me, uh, <laughs> between me answering some, you asking and me answering something. Yeah? That would be uncomfortable. Yeah, or, or it would not be usable. And so there's lots of technical challenges around speech recognition, about wake word recognition, about making sure that you learn certain accents, and try my accent and, and, and Alexa, not a great combination sometimes. And I get to listen to lots of other music that I had not asked. <laughs> um, and there's nothing to do with Alexa, that's me, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, no, but so this is a bit of a problem too, right? Did, 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 did Siri famously have difficulty with yes. Scottish accent? I can imagine that. <laughs> Even I have problems with that. Um, no, so I, I think we are doing... Alexa has, I think, surprised everyone with the very high quality of, of recognition. That's one thing. I think the other thing is that we immediately, as so many things that we do at Amazon, is opening them up for innovation by balance. Yeah, we're very strong believers that if we build a platform with no great gatekeepers, there is nobody that tells you, you cannot do this on this platform. Yeah, so we build this platform where everybody can extend it. So immediately, of course, the company starts to extend it. You know, it's uh, Uber extended it, so I can say, hey, Alexa, uh, send an Uber to my home. Or, hey, Domino's, send me a large pepperoni pizza. And so all of these new skills, as they call them, is extending the, the, the platform. This is sort of, in my eyes, sort of the next app style platform. Yeah. So where's, where's Everybody the, will be out extending this with all their functionality. Where is the best? So the idea of a new input is fascinating, right? We've been tapping into computers for a while, and even the tap on your phone is kind of a, you know, a proxy for that. But speech is very different, as you just outlined. So, what is the, you know, we, we've all been in situations, I think, where we've tried to use speech recognition and it hasn't worked and it's been very frustrating. For me, it was the car, you know, I'm driving in the highway and I kept fighting with my car, it's terrible. So, where is the best place, do you think? So, if, if Alexa can go anywhere, where's the best place in your mind that Alexa should go? And where's the place that, you know, we talk about it all the time, it's kind of like the smart toaster with the Internet of Things. It's kind of like, oh, uh, no, not really. <laughs> um, I don't know. So, uh, I haven't really thought about that that much, but we've seen uh, a lot of examples already where actually both your hands are busy. And that means, for example, in the operating room. Sure. Yeah. Um, there's, there's many occasions now where surgeons actually have to manipulate multiple devices at the same time. That sounds uh, terrifying. Yeah, but actually, I don't really want my surgeon to be manipulating multiple devices. Yeah, so we're, we're basically yeah. they're basically just getting to all that thing on there right. while actually moving that other machine. <laughs> and it would be much easier if you could do that by voice as being sort of your third hand. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I think there's there's um, there's lots of occasions I think where where also where the conversational interaction becomes much more important. I mean now. We're still at the phase where you know you can give commands and you, you can interact with it. But there's lots of people that are building very interesting, for example, a drill down quizzes. Really mm -hmm. Really figuring out what is it that you want to do. Um, I think the, the, the engagements as with humans are unlimited. Yeah, but as an interface, you still have to have a platform behind it that allows everybody else to build very innovative services. Serve services. Um, if you look at healthcare, for example, and sorry to come back to that example, but much of sort of doctors' interaction with patients is really going through what's called a decision tree. You ask this question, then you ask that question, and basically come into some sort of decision where then at the end maybe there is some other information necessary about blood cell count and things like that, but it is actually just going through a fixed number of steps. The basic and decision of confidence. Right. Yeah, sort of. Yeah. And you can imagine that, you know, the first interaction with, you know, your, 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 your daughter is falling ill at home, she has a high temperature, you might have a sort of interaction which you now would go to WebMD for with sort of much more voice-like 
there's much more natural interaction to actually drive through that decision tree. Probably in the end, it's all says go to the hospital. <laughs> but you, know, uh, you might actually have a few steps before. Right. So we're in New York City. Actually, going back to machine learning. Yeah, please. It's not scary. Yeah, let's first get uh, this one out of the way. Terrified of the rise of No, no, no. Whatever, you know, remember that at the basis of, uh, of uh, uh, artificial intelligence is the two computer, uh, computer science areas. One is machine learning, and the other is natural language processing. Yeah, we have both of those. Machine learning is basically taking information from the past to try and make predictions about the future. Right? Yeah, and so uh, it's just one natural extension of what data analytics is. Now, there are three different areas. Business intelligence that looks towards the past. We have all the real-time stuff that's happening today, so real-time analytics, what is happening now? How are my customers talking about me now? What is my inventory level right now? And then there is sort of the future looking, so can I take information from the past to predict things about the future or predict things about now? Um, and I was going to be using machine learning forever. You know, and if you are at some customers, I hope that some of you are, you probably have used recommendations. Yeah? Recommendations is machine learning. Basically looking at sort of this set of, product, this set of products, so sort of your, your history of how you, how you like to buy things and then making predictions about the future. The famous you may also like. Yeah, yeah. sort of. Things, things like that. But we also do it, if an order comes in, what's the likelihood that this is a formal order? Yeah, what's the likelihood that this is a, uh, um, what's it, a formal uh, uh, um, sub submission? Um, how to set our inventory levels, how to do everything within Amazon's almost machine in the yeah? Taking data from the past to make sort of predictions about the future. Everybody here, by the way, can use this. If you're a little bit technical, capable, we build a machine learning service for you. Yeah, that's part of the whole cloud thing, and everybody can integrate this into it. And we've got kids that are, have no experience with machine learning at all, that are integrating this into our apps in about 20 minutes. So, the takeaway here is we will tame the machines. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Vernon, thank you so much. Everybody, around.